it'll be directly across the hall, by the way. So uh, we'll we'll direct you in that direction after lunch. So, Richard, thanks. Just a pointer. Yep, that's it. <clears throat> well, our operation uh, we've been in business for four generations. And since it's since about 1900 in the Durango area, is David James here? David, those are your cows. <clears throat> and and you probably thought that they were grazing in front of those sheep, but actually they're cleaning up behind the sheep. <laughs> uh, we've been in Southwest Colorado for quite a number of years, and. We were a uh, in, in sheep ranching for you know most of those years, and it's during the time that I have managed the ranch that we went into multi-species grazing. Actually, we started in the 1980s when we learned uh, rotational grazing and holistic management from Stan Parsons and Alan Savory, and then in the 1990s we went into direct marketing, <clears throat> and now in the uh, this decade now we're going into the the recreation business so we've done a number of things over the years but we're, we're always busy trying new things we don't ever we don't we don't ever get stuck in the mud that's one that's one thing about our our operation uh, we have ran uh, sheep on the forest service we ran sheep on the the BLM uh, right now we're down to a thousand one hundred uh, acres of private land that we run sheep on and cattle and goats and pigs and chickens <laughs> and we have 900 acres of that is certified organic so so we and we have been certified organic for about five years okay which oh, okay okay so we're going to outline um, some of the benefits of multi-species grazing uh, the, the first one is it, it is it improves. Well, let me get in front of this computer screen. Either that, or we're going to have to move this forward so I can see that. But I hate to stand behind the podium, but I I guess I will. The no, oh, well, that's okay. The the first benefit is that it improves diversity and utilization, and we're talking about the resource base. Okay. The the second benefit we're going to talk about this morning is it increases your production per acre. And that is because it utilizes more of the resource. <clears throat> now, that may or may not be a good thing. It depends upon your management objectives that, that you might have. Okay, it increases profits per acre. We're going to talk about how that becomes possible. And profit is good because guess what? Profit is the, the basic plank of sustainability. And that's something that I am very fond of repeating. So we're in this business for profit or we won't last. Okay, and the fourth benefit, the control of noxious weeds. We're going to show some slides on that and how that's accomplished. And the fifth benefit, we're going to improve our risk management because it's just like if you diversified your stock portfolio, you don't have all your eggs or your, all your species in one basket. So it, you're going to diversify your risk that, that way. Okay, let's talk about the first one, to improve diversity and utilization. Okay. Uh, your uh, forage utilization is going to be increased by 50% if you will combine sheep and cattle together on the same grazing resource as opposed to having just cattle by themselves. And we'll, we'll, talk, and we'll get to some slides and show you how that's possible, but we're going to go through that, but that's fact number one. This is based on studies done at the, the sheep experiment station at Du Bois, Idaho. Now, the second thing is to increase the diversity of plant species consumed by grazing animals. And we're going to talk about that how cattle have a tendency to, to graze grasses, sheep have a tendency to, to graze forbs, goats like to browse. The combination of all these species working together, you increase the utilization. Okay, here's an example. Sheep like to graze uh, forbs. Things like leafy spurge, lark spur, and sheep will graze near a cattle manure deposit where cattle do not like to graze close to their own manure. Okay, cattle graze the coarse grasses. <clears throat> One thing that I learned uh, when I first started to get cattle about 10 years ago 
is, is I would get out the mower to actually get my pastures back into sheep quality, what I considered pastures that were good enough for grazing sheep. Well, now I don't use the mower any longer. I use cattle. And it's preferable to use someone else's cattle because <laughs> they make good mowers. <laughs> Whoops, went too fast. Okay, and then goats, famous for grazing uh, browse. And if you're in it, in the Midwest, goats are getting popular because they're grazing these uh, nuisance species here, like the, the blackberry and multiflora rose. But we can graze goats here in the West, too. And we're going to talk about that. But you have to be careful that you have the, uh, the resource base to graze goats. Okay, the, the second point was to increase your production per acre. And here's the rule of thumb that every cattleman can add one sheep and sometimes a goat, may, you know, maybe not, but for sure you can put one sheep for every cow that you have and you don't even know they're there. If you have 250 cows and you're a cattle rancher, you can put 250 ewes out there and you, know, you don't even know they're there. And you might think, oh, I need more land. I mean, what am I going to do? I've got 250 sheep now. But what I'm saying is you won't even know they're there other than that you have to manage them. And we'll talk about that. So that's how you increase the production. That's pure profit. Why don't more cattlemen put sheep out there? It's called prejudice. <laughs> and I call it cattle prejudice. <laughs> okay, so basically you are going to increase the utilization, the overall species mix on a per acre basis. So your production goes up because you're utilizing more. <laughs> Okay, profit, the, the third factor. Obviously, you're going to increase the income from the same management overheads. Let's just say that you were this cattle rancher that had 250 cows. Well, lo and behold, you put 250 ewes out there. Your profit has went up, okay? And we're using the same labor and the same land, the same resource base. You know, if it's a family farm, maybe the labor is you and your family. It's all the same, but now you have some sheep. Maybe you have some goats out there. So that's pure profit. Uh, one of the things that, that takes place when you use multi-species grazing is you can control weeds and you can control internal parasites by using those different species. And those are, are inputs that you do not have to purchase and that's things that you do not have to do. So again, that's a cost savings, translates to profit. We mentioned the control of noxious weeds, a little too fast, and then internal parasite control. You know, you know those are the, the two things that, that come to mind right off the top here. Here's a picture of uh, some sheep. Guess what they're grazing? What's that yellow flower? Leafy spurge. Okay, these are pictures from Montana. I'm sorry, I don't have leafy spurge on my ranch. I, I'd show you some pictures of it, but I don't. Uh, they did some uh, research up in Montana. It was called the, the TEAM uh, research done on leafy spurge grazing. It was in the Little Missouri River drainage. And they showed uh, right here a 90% a control of leafy spurge by using sheep. And then, of course, cattle and bison do not graze leafy spurge unless they are forced to. So they become a good tool. Here's a picture here. From that project, this is your, your leafy spurge on the left, you know, no sheep, sheep grazing on the right, the leafy spurge has been grazed and set back. <clears throat> and then long term, you can see results like this. Here's the pictures that are top and bottom. This is 1998, we see the leafy spurge. The sheep grazing, the year 2000, leafy spurge is knocked back. Well, you might say, well, you graze it, it comes back. That's true. But what if you graze it every year with multi-species grazing? Then you're getting a handle on it. So you just can't do it one time and say, well, I've controlled it. But it, it takes you know, year after year management under, under multi-species grazing. In the southwest, where I'm from, uh, we have more problem with things like the tamarisk. And the, here's some goats going after the tamarisk. In some parts of the southwest, that's all there is. <laughs> it's tamarisk. So that's, the, you know, obviously the goats will graze the tamarisk. The third factor was risk management. And we talked about diversifying your sources of income, same thing as diversifying your stock portfolio. 
So we don't want all of our eggs in one basket. That's one of the benefits of multi-species grazing. Uh, several years ago in the Stockman Grass Farmer magazine, I wrote some articles about a, 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 ten, a, a ten year cycle in sheep. Uh, Alan Nation wrote about the cattle cycle. We found that these two cycles, and if you're a conventional producer, had a tendency to run the opposite of each other. <laughs> cattle were high, sheep were low. Sheep were high, cattle were low. That's in the conventional market. So you can see how you get some, some risk ma management here by diversity. Uh, the, the thing, too, that happens when you have multi-species, it smooths out the, the paychecks. You get more than one paycheck a year. In fact, you can get quite a few. Of course, the, the step beyond that is to get into direct marketing, and then you get paychecks every week. <laughs> but you also have headaches every week, so it's, it's not that easy. And then you also diversify your health risk because, again, it's the old principle of not having all your eggs in one basket. And we find, too, that there are, are complementary benefits of these species that they have upon each other that reduces the overall health risk that's a, there upon your farm. Okay, I got it. <clears throat> okay, so now those are the benefits. So the, ne the next question that you have probably is how do I implement multi-species grazing? Well, we're going to go through six steps here. The first one is to evaluate your grazing resources. And number two is to match your species to your resource. And number three, to identify your centerpiece species. And number four, identify your ancillary species. And five, implement your grazing method or methods. And number six is to look out for problems. So let's go to the first one. How do we match our species to our grazing resource? Well, here's a, a table. We've probably all seen this, but when we look down through the table, we see that cattle, as a general rule, they eat what? Mostly grass. They eat mostly grass. When we look at sheep, what do they mostly eat? Forbs. So what do goats? What do they mostly eat? Browse, but see, goats are the highest of all being resource specific, 78% browse. And that's something very important to keep in mind because if you have goats, there might come a time that the goats have to go because the resource is gone. And if you keep them and stubbornly keep them when the resource is gone, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Okay, now we're going to talk about the environmental niche. What kind of a climate do you have? Well, let's put them all up here so we can compare them. And this is generally speaking. And we know there's been a lot of uh, adaptations. There's different breeds. You know, you can put, uh, you know, because of uh, the advent of hair sheep, you can put them in a lot of hot and dry climates. But generally speaking, the sheep go in the cool and dry climate. That's the reason they're popular in, you know, western Colorado, Nevada, Utah, places like that. Cattle do well in a hot and moist climate. It's the general rule of Texas, wet, or East, Tex East Texas, Missouri, Southeast. Goats do well in West Texas, hot and dry climate. The dairy states, where is it cool and moist? Around the Great Lakes, Wisconsin, Michigan. And there's reasons those things took place 100 years ago, because that's the way the animals fit. Now, you can look at your operation, and you might. the most fundamental question is, am I trying to fight? this? Am I going against it? Am I stubbornly saying I'm going to run cattle where I should be having sheep? No, too many times we do that. Okay, here's a picture of our, our grazing pigs, and I'm just throwing this out here because we're not going to talk in detail about our pigs, but these are a couple of the, uh, the sows that we have. These are our heritage breeds. These are called, uh, or these are a crossbred between a large black and, and a red a red wattle. Here's a picture of the, uh, the grazing pigs here. We have some cattle here, and we have some sheep in the background here. And these paddocks are all under irrigation. Here's a picture of our, our grazing chickens, and this is the, the egg mobile. We have two of these. And when a chicken is out grazing, what is the primary food source? Insects. That's exactly right. But they do graze. A considerable part of their diet is from grazing, and that's the reason that the, that the yolks turn orange from the beta carotene, okay? But we're not going to talk in detail about the chickens. We're going to stay with the, the three species, sheep, goats, and cattle. 
because that's what most people do. So how do you decide if I'm going to be, I'm going to have mostly cattle or I'm going to have mostly sheep or I'm going to have mostly goats? And then we're going to start adding other species around that. How do you decide that? Well, you know what most people do? They say, I like cattle. And that's, and that's what we've got. <clears throat> but they really haven't approached it right. Well, if you're in business for long enough, you'll find out you know, what makes money. And this first test here is basically, it's a financial test to see that, that, it, that if I make you know, $10,000 raising sheep, they cost me $5,000, that's you know, $5,000 profit, that's a 50% you know, gross margin. That's before you go to the cost of overheads, land, and labor. If, if you have cattle and you find that you're only making 20%, on your cattle operation before overheads, guess what? You know, your advantage is toward the sheep. Or it could be reversed. The advantage is toward, or is toward the cattle or it's toward goats. Then we talked about the climate, the, envi the environment that you have been given. What is your grazing resource? Is it primarily grass? Is it primarily forbs? Is it primarily browse? You know, those will determine what species should dominate on your operation. And then once you choose the species that fits the environment and the financial test, then you can start putting the other species in around that main species. And, and we call that having a, a centerpiece operation, the main thing you do, and then around it you stack what's called the ancillary enterprises. So in, in the case of Foxfire Farms, uh, we, we had always done the best with sheep, but yet we put cattle, goats, pigs, chickens, things like that around the, the resource and the, and the labor we had available because of the sheep enterprise. So that's the concept of choosing your centerpiece. See, here's a joke for the dairy people. Okay, I'm going to talk about dietary overlap. Now, what do I mean by dietary overlap? Well, sheep and cattle will compete for the same resource about 40% of the time. 60% of the time, they're eating a completely different dietary resource. So there's only 40% overlap. And really, when you look at it, that's not too bad. So, so the animals complement each other, okay? If you have cattle and sheep, and you say, well, do I need some goats? Well, goats even have less of a dietary overlap or, or direct competition to the cattle and sheep, only 15%. And what's the reason why again? What did we learn? They're browsers. 78% of their diet is browse. So they're not going to compete much with your cattle and your sheep, but that's assuming you've got some browse for them. You have to have the, the, the feed resource. And here's an example just uh, to exercise our mind. Uh, a deer and elk in Colorado have a 75% dietary overlap. And that means what? They compete with each other. So if you're a wildlife manager in Colorado, what do you do? You manage for the elk or for the deer. Which do you do? Well, let's see. The elk license sells for $300 and the deer license for, okay, we'll do elk. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it's done, right? <laughs> okay. So here's some comparisons and some ratios. Uh, I've always uh, taken issue with the... The, the, the official conversion rate of one cow-calf to five sheep families. It's really seven. One cow-calf pair equals sheep or seven sheep families. And the reason we're going to throw these numbers out here is so that you can look at it on paper to say, well, I have so many cattle and then I want so many pounds of sheep and perhaps I can have so many pounds or so many head of goats. Okay. One stalker or 1,000-pound yearling is the equivalent of five sheep families. And isn't it a 1,000-pound you know, stalker or dry cow that's considered an animal unit? Isn't that true? Okay. Okay, the rule of thumb that 3% of body weight dry matter is the feed requirement. This applies to both species. So whatever you know, if you know how to feed cattle, hey, feeding sheep is not that hard. It's the same rules. It's not that hard to learn. So that's kind of what I'm here to tell you. Hey, it's not that hard. So if you've been afraid of it, don't be. Okay, goats have a tendency to be smaller body weight. They're about 75 to 80% of the body weight of sheep. 
So, so you're dealing here with even lesser numbers, but again, a resource-specific animal. Okay, here's some pictures of some goats, and guess where these goats are? Are they out grazing in the, on the irrigated pastures? They're in the woodlands, in the timberlands. And, you know, the goats we have, their favorite food, their favorite forage is willows. They just love willows. But if you want to manage four willows in a riparian area, guess what? You better not have any goats because that's the first thing that they will eliminate. They love willows. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about goats. Uh, we already saw the number here that they have a 78% uh, browse. That's, that, that's, that's what they like. But they only have a 15% dietary overlap, meaning competing with the other two species, and that they are a resource-specific grazer. If you start out with a lot of browse, and you've had goats for 5, 10 years, and the browse is gone, what do you do? You should sell the goats. You should, and yeah, there's a time that the goats must go. You don't take the goats and stick them down with the sheep. And this is the reason why, is, is goats are very susceptible to internal parasites. And that's because they have spent their, their you know, past grazing with their head up on the browse, no parasites. So they have no resistance to internal parasites. You stick them in with the sheep, you're going to have parasite problems in the goats. And, you know, these are things I throw out there because, uh, for, you know, from a certified organic standpoint, it's problems that we have ran into. Okay, let's talk about sheep. Uh, the sheep, they prefer forbs. Okay, what's a forb? Broadleaf plant, a weed. Okay, they love weeds. They love uh, bindweed, uh, all kinds of things like that. You know, whatever, you know, you know that, that you might have in that category, they love it. They only compete 40% with cattle. Here's this rule of thumb that all cattle operations could run some sheep. So let's say that you had 250 cows and you put 250 ewes out there and you get a poor lamb crop of 100%. And I call that poor because if you manage your sheep, there's no reason you can't get 150, 160% lamb crops. So you raise 25,000 pounds of lamb at a dollar a pound, that's $25,000 that this cattle ranch could have had that they're letting go. Okay, let's talk about cattle. Some of the numbers here that we have already seen, cattle, 62% preference toward grass, and only a 40% uh, dietary overlap with sheep, 15% with goats, and too many operations, uh, and I underline this, have cattle as the centerpiece when they should be centerpiecing a different species because the grazing resource is browse or forbs, it's not grass. Or the climate does not fit. One thing that we've had to do in our high mountain pastures, <clears throat> especially on the, on the forest land, is, is above timberline you don't graze cattle. And why is that? Brisket disease, that's right. So again, that's another reason that in our part of the country, the, the grazing allotments went to the sheep are all above timberline. Cattle permits were down lower in the, in, in the, in the forest service. So that's another thing that, that might differentiate the two species. So how are you going to graze these animals? And this is probably uh, something that uh, you, you have heard before, maybe, you know, maybe not, but we're going to talk about follow the leader grazing or top grazing. We're going to talk about flurred grazing. Who knows what a flurred is? A flock and a herd, okay. That's right. And that, then uh, number three is a term that I came up with because I couldn't think of a term to call this third method that we, have, that we use at Foxfire Farms. I call it complementary grazing, so I'll show, you, I'll show you this in a minute here. So we're back to the picture that we started with, and we have one species of animal following the other species through the grazing cell. This is called follow the leader grazing. Okay, in this case, are we gonna have cattle first or are we gonna have sheep first? Okay, well there's a scientific way to figure out which animal goes first. And you go here, the highest nutritional requirement 
animal goes first. In that case, sheep and lambs would go in front of cows and calves because sheep have a higher nutritional requirement. They have to have better feed. It's just a plain and simple way of, of saying it. If you had uh, a stock or cattle, you know, yearlings that you were finishing or that were growing, they would go in, hit, they would go in front of the ewes and lambs because they had a higher nutritional requirement. Okay, if you had, uh, there is such a thing as stalker lambs, just a herd of grazing lambs, they would go in front of stalker cattle because, again, lambs have a high nutritional requirement. If you're in the dairy business, you know, lactating dairy cattle, high nutritional requirement, go first, they're lactating. Dry cattle would go second to clean up behind the lactating cattle. So that's follow the leader grazing. It's difficult to implement. And the reason that I say this is, what happens if you leave these lactating dairy cattle too long in the paddock? What happens? The milk production goes down. Okay. <laughs> Meg knows. And, you know, things can go wrong. But it doesn't mean that, that you shouldn't do it. It doesn't mean that it's not a good method. What I'm saying is that you have to closely monitor it. You have to watch what you're doing. Uh, here's a picture of uh, flirt grazing at, at Foxfire Farms. So we have some, some goats here, and these are, these are kid goats that have been weaned. This is what we call our, our finishing herd, and we like to put them together as a flirt. And we have lambs here that are weaned, and then we have yearling cattle here. And they are uh, grass finishing to be slaughtered. The reason the field is a different color, they're, they're grazing cereal rye that was planted for, for grazing specifically. So that's flirt grazing. This is a dysfunctional flirt, where there's, and I think it was is caused by human interference. But you know, you want the flirt to mix together, okay? You don't want them to be like that. Discrimination That's discrimination. <laughs> but I think there was some. I suspect the way they're looking, there's some human interference going on here to the side. Okay, um, how do you get a flirt to work? Well, you can bond the animals to each other. You can confine them in, in, a, in a small area, 14 to 30 days, to create this bond, and then they will stay together. If you're going to have sheep, you should have a guardian animal, especially lambs. Don't rely on the cattle to protect the sheep and goats. A lot of people will say, oh, the cattle will just run off the coyote. But it's been my experience, don't count on it. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. The, the flirt. It can be your finishing herd. We do what's called top grazing. Top grazing means that this, this, this herd of animals comes through and they pick the very best. They pick the very best of the grazing resource. Very short duration grazes. They move on to the next fresh paddock. And then coming in behind this flirt can be you know, cattle, a large herd of uh, cow-calf herd, a large herd of ewes and lambs, whatever it is that's going to clean it up behind this finishing herd. And again, I'm going to put the cattleman's rule of thumb here, and I'm going to keep repeating this until some of you cattlemen actually do this. You know, add one sheep to each cow, no reduction in your stocking rates or your animal unit months. And I'm sure that and your grazing allotments that your uh, agency people will go right along with that. <laughs> right? <laughs> no? <laughs> so what kind of prejudice are we dealing with here? So we have prejudice on the, on the level of the ranchers, on the level of the agencies, and we have a lot to overcome, don't we? Okay, complementary grazing, and what this means is we have a separate herd of sheep or, or ewes and lambs. We're going to have a separate herd of cattle. In this case, it's a, it's a cow-calf herd here. And we're going to graze them separate through, uh, through the grazing cells Okay, 10 minutes. We're going to have two grazing cells, and we're going to rotate the sheep through one grazing cell. Let's say we have 60 paddocks, and we're going to rotate the sheep through one paddock, and then the cattle have their, have their or through one grazing cell. The sheep have one grazing cell. The cattle have one grazing cell. And what this does is it conditions the pasture for the next species because what you do is after you've rotated through one grazing cell, you swap and that the cattle go where the sheep just were, and the sheep go where the cattle just were. And so that the cattle have conditioned the pasture for the sheep. Remember, I didn't get out the mower. 
but all the grass is taken down, and it, it looks beautiful, and it's, it's ready for, for grazing by sheep. The other benefit is parasite control. And if you're certified organic, this becomes very important because each species is a dead-end host for the, the internal parasites of the other species. Now, the, the first place I saw this being done was in New Zealand. Okay, here's a, here's, here's a picture of it. So we have the you know, grazing cell, 25 to 30 paddocks up here. Down here, we have another 25 to 30 paddocks where the sheep are. We can see how that they swap. The reason uh, that we have 25 to 30 paddocks is because I want a 30-day rotation. And the reason I want a 30-day rotation is for parasite control. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a minute. But if you're going to do this complementary grazing, in this case, you want to stock your two grazing cells kind of, you know, kind of evenly. So what I would shoot for is 50% cattle and 50% sheep by weight, not by head count, to stock them with the same weight of grazing animals, each, each grazing cell. And then you can adjust, you know, in, in our case, we have more sheep than we have cattle. In, in your case, maybe you might have a, a few more cattle than you have sheep, but you don't have to hit it perfectly, that's what I'm saying. Here's a picture I, I took in Australia, and they were conditioning the pasture with goats. And back up here is a goat, and, and there were goats scattered all, all over this uh, uh, forest here. But they had a, a problem with blackberries popping up everywhere. And so what they did is they put one wire about waist level, and that held the cattle, and they had their paddock system, their grazing system, and they had one wire, and the goats went under the wire and went anywhere they wanted to. So, you know, the places where these blackberries were there, they came and they, and they grazed it. Now, again, there's a point that the goats would have to go. Okay, we'll talk about parasite control. <clears throat> um, sunlight is, is death to parasite larvae. And so you want to graze down to let the sunlight in, but you don't want to graze too low because if the lower you graze, the more of the, of the parasite eggs that you're taking into the animal. So you've got to l open up the canopy, let the sunlight in, but don't graze too low. And, and that means in some cases as low as one-third, and in some cases it might be down to taking 50% of, of the canopy off of, of, of what you're grazing, of the paddock. You need a 30-day rest period, and the reason why is because uh, most parasites have a 21-day life cycle. So, you know, 90-some percent of the parasite larvae are, are going to be gone after 21 days. So that's why we want a 30-day rest period before we come back in. And that is even when that we're using the, the dead-end host species, because that's like, you know, that's like making double sure. We're going to wait 30 days, and then after the sheep, we're going to bring in cattle. Or we're going to wait 30 days, and after the cattle, we're going to bring in sheep. And so that, you know, these are some of the most effective methods to control parasites uh, organically. Now, for simplicity's sake, you know, perhaps maybe you just want to put the cattle and the sheep all together. And I'm not saying that you can't do that, but, you know, because that works too. And then, you know, be on the watch for, for carrier-type animals. Uh, there are studies done in... In, in New Zealand, that there, there, there are animals that are chronically wormy, just like chronically with lice. And, you know, what do you do? You get rid of them. That's what you do. And then you need to have a program for the sheep and the goats. And this is assuming that you are not certified organic. And, and by that, I mean strategic drenching. You know, if you're not certified organic, if you're a conventional type, type of an operation. There, there's no reason you can't worm the ewes in the springtime before the spring rise, and that will help a lot of your problems. Do that in, in conjunction with these other management tools, you're going to be way ahead of the game. Some of the things that you can do, I'm just putting some pictures in here that you can graze lambs on the gain. This is, this is really, it's not you and lamb, but it's, you know, feeder lambs. Okay, this is something that uh, we used to bring lambs up out of San Angelo and graze them here um, and put gain on them just like you would cattle, of course. And we've, we've done this too by grazing stalkers. 
What we do now is uh, we uh, all of our stocker cattle go into our meat business. And here's some of the numbers. You can actually do a little bit better grazing lambs than what you can by, by grazing uh, steers. I'm not going to go into details. We're kind of running out of time. But the uh, current trend, goats have become really popular in, in the Midwest. And there, there are lots and lots of goats going into the Midwest, places like Missouri, eastern, eastern Kansas. And then once those cattlemen get goats, they start complaining. Oh, those goats can't keep them anywhere, you know. Problems are always out in the neighbors. So hair sheep are easier to handle than goats. Hair sheep are less susceptible to parasites. And I'm talking about the typical Midwestern, high humidity, okay, parasite, hair sheep, you know. Then the hair sheep utilize a broader grazing resource. And I think that there's, this trend is, has already started to take place, that the goats are starting to leave, and a lot of those uh, grazers are switching to hair sheep, and the goats are going. So some of the problems and, 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 the, and the obstacles that you have to overcome to successfully implement the multi-species grazing, well, number one is the prejudice. That's number one. That's the number one reason that why more ranchers and farmers aren't doing it. They just are prejudiced against one species. Okay, there's an increased cost in fencing requirements, but it's a minimal cost. If you've got a grazing cell, you just put another couple of wires on it and you're ready for sheep and goats. Um, sometimes there's a, a conflict in supplemental feeding. If you have a flurd, you know, you want to feed something to the cattle, but the sheep are going to eat it. Well, and then sometimes you might have bully animals that hog all the feed. You know, these are typical problems that you would have in any livestock situation. What we do in Foxfire Farms is though we graze some of these flurds in the summertime is by the time that the winter comes around is we have the sheep are separate, cattle are separate, and the goats are separate so we can take care of them according to their individual needs. So that's one way that we've overcome those problems. And then you have the problem of predators. And you should always worry about predators. And the, the simplest way is guard dogs. And I got guard dogs in somewhere around 1980. So how many years ago has that been? Almost 30-some years. And there isn't hardly a sheep ranch left in the western United States that doesn't use guard dogs. Everybody uses them. They're effective. And it's an easy way to take care of predators. So here's a few parting shots here. Uh, if you're going to graze sheep and goats, and I'm talking to you cattlemen, you know, be sure and have a guardian animal. Have one of these guard dogs. And the, 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 the llamas and the donkeys don't work too well in my part of the country because they get eaten by the, the mountain lions. <laughs> so we prefer the dogs. You need a health management program for sheep and goats. There's this prejudice that sheep are looking for a place to die. Well, <laughs> so are cattle. <laughs> but if you have a health management program, a little bit of education into this species, well, it's easy to take care of. Um, Let's see, let's go on here. And then you need to have a marketing plan. If you just have a, uh, just a handful of sheep and goats, it's always best to attempt to direct market them. If you take a small bunch of sheep and goats to the sale barn, you get skinned. And you come back home saying, well, I didn't make any money on these darn sheep. I got skinned. Well, you didn't have enough. So if you have a small amount, direct market them. If you want to get big and you're commercial, you need to have a truckload lot so you can get those animals out of there and to the good markets. Okay, so there's a picture of our, our guard dog, and so multi-species grazing is a hidden opportunity. So that's it.